Welcome, everyone, to our automated catalyst wrapping sh station. Uh, my name is Kyle Sylvia. I am the team lead for this project, and I am accompanied by Nathan Lozada, Kevin Swenson, Tyra Lyons, Justin Butterfield, and Eric Sylvia. So here's a short video of introducing our sponsor and overall project. supply the need for Subaru at a way to converge. Since the 1950s, the family run shops have followed their predecessors in the exhaust industry, including MSA manufacturing, which supplied the exhaust adapters and certain on sales. The plant is located in downtown New Bedford at a 32,000 square foot plant, which allows them to better meet their customer strong demands. Devco annually attends the AAPEX show, trade show in Nevada, which is the world's largest business event for the aftermarket market automotive industry. This is where they exhibit their specialty, which is hard to find direct fit at a way converters. The PBO brings serve on both running Devco and sponsoring our project. We are grateful for his time, funding, and his understanding of this project as a career. As said before, Dathco manufactures catalytic converters in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Catalytic converters are part of the exhaust system that turns carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide in order to decrease pollutants into the environment. The three materials involved in this process are cylindrical pieces of ceramic, steel tubes, and small sheets of fabric. The ceramic is wrapped in fabric and stuffed into steel tubes to fabricate a catalytic converter. The ceramic is filled with precious metals that allow this chemical reaction to be carried out. The fabric acts as a spacer between the tube and ceramic to ensure the ceramic is tightly locked into the tube. In addition to this, the fabric also prevents the ceramic from cracking when being stuffed as it's a very brittle material. Dathco currently does this process manually by hand, making it very inefficient. They asked us to automate this process in order for them to save time and money. Fully automating the wrapping and stuffing process while producing high quality parts is the goal for our team. So as a group, we were tasked with the uh, objective of creating an automated machine that could produce 250 units per day throughout the 8 hour workday. In automating the process uh, of wrapping, we wanted this process to be less than six minutes, which is their current uh, production time. In this uh, machine, we also wanted it to be able to handle the various uh, sizes of substrates and wraps that Davco uses. And we wanted to produce consistent results uh, of wrapping and stuffing, so there were no tears or issues with alignment. Here's our criteria for success we created earlier in the year. Uh, we are proud to say that we did hit most of our marks. One that we did not is it is not fully autonomous. Someone is needed to move the wrap substrate over to the stuffing chamber. We are hoping, however, uh, future, future teams can merge the two machines with little modifications needed. Here at Project Design Specifications, the top three being the most important as a performance, safety, and accuracy performance, like Eric said, to produce at least 250 parts per day. Safety, following OSHA standards. For instance, we put in an emergency stop in case anything goes wrong. And then accuracy and reliability, basically, the wrap needs to be placed in the same spot every single time without bunching, and it needs to be stuffed to the correct depth every single time. So this is a continuation project from past years. So at the beginning of the year, we had to evaluate the, uh, the past machine, and we needed to analyze and uh, make a decision if we wanted to expand on their current design, or if we wanted to completely redesign, which is what we decided to do. So the past uh, machine was large and overcomplicated. It featured a center claw that would rotate to various stations to perform the processes. And we were having uh, many issues when testing it with alignment and repeatability. And we also found that it was a tough to adapt to the uh, various sizes of substrates and wraps. 
So when coming up with our first concept, we wanted to utilize that, that claw that uh, the previous group had developed. And we, we tried to uh, avoid the use of adhesive. So we were essentially trying to design a claw that would close the wrap of, uh, around the substrate and then simultaneously have a stuffing piston push that wrap and substrate into the steel tube. When testing this, we were having issues with the, uh, the wrap bunching on the side of the steel tube and uh, we weren't getting consistent results so we had to look elsewhere. This is our second concept, so we, we discovered that basically that the adhesive was essential to keeping that fabric alongside that substrate. So we utilized adhesive in this design, and uh, adhesive would be dispensed onto a wrap, where it then be pushed into a uh, rolling machine that we call it, and it has a driven mold, uh, rotor, motor, and that would push the fabric around the substrate and wrapping and uh, allow for that fabric to adhere to the substrate. We could then take that, that wrap substrate and bring it over to a stuffing piston and stuff that uh, wrap substrate into the steel tube and have a completed product. So this is more into our design selection. Obviously we went with three main concepts. Uh, the first is concept one, like Eric said, it uses a claw that would wrap the substrate and then stuff it directly into the tube. Uh, through testing, obviously we decided that would, wouldn't work or wasn't consistent enough. Uh, the second concept, which is what we focused on for this project, was a rolling chamber that would uh, roll the wrap onto the substrate, uh, and then it would then move into a stuffing uh, chamber attached to that machine. Due to time and budget constraints, we uh, couldn't integrate the two. So the picture in the bottom right is just a look at a work cell, which would just take the operator to take the wrap substrate and move it into the stuffing chamber and activate that process. During the design selection, uh, we considered all the factors that were important to the scope of our project and weighted them on their importance, and then graded each design on how they met those, uh, that criteria. So uh, like I mentioned, our official design, much like concept two, uh, the simplest way for me to describe it is like a label is rolled onto a can. Um, it's comprised of, uh, it contains three pneumatic pistons, uh, two that load the substrate and the fabric into position, and one to apply pressure during the rolling process to avoid any sort of bunching or catching. Um, the substrates are gravity fed using an angle track and uh, the rolling chamber itself utilizes a series of rollers, two driven rollers to uh, maintain contact and um, avoid any sort of bunching or catching during the process. This is, this is our test plan and our failure analysis model. Uh, and so this is between the first design and the secondary design. And so the first design is what we see here on the uh, left side of the table. It has the uh, red box. That's just dictating that uh, the data in the has higher value than the um, data in the green box, uh, showing that our secondary design was a more repeatable, more refined, and a process that resulted in uh, better efficiencies. So for the design that we went with, we had to test multiple adhesives. adhesives. The video on the right uh, shows us testing a bead pattern going across the width of the adhesive. We also tested applying dots to the tabs of the fabric, as well as applying a bead going the full length of the fabric. In one of the videos you'll see later, um, we do apply dots on the tabs, but it also is a bead going the length. Um, it was a little tough to get it uh, to stop in, uh, without the use of an adhesive dispenser. Uh, we decided on Loctite 401, uh, we just thought that was the best adhesive based on all the ones that we tested. Didn't react with the fabric. It, it bonded quick enough, and it it stuck to the fabric and the substrate. Throughout the year, 3D printing was huge to prove out concepts, and we 3D printed many parts, including in the picture you can see top right the rolling chamber brackets to make sure that they would actually fit on the design, hold the rollers, which eventually the ceramic and fabric sit in. And in the bottom right, you can see our overall rolling chamber. 
printed. Other parts that we also printed were uh, the Fabric Feed magazine, the Ceramic Feed Guide, Rolling Chamber Exit, and um, the piston head for the Fabric Feed cartridge. And 3D printing it basically just saved us time as opposed to machining everything and realizing we had to go back and redesign. The machine shop was a huge part of this project because we had many custom made parts. Paul Sousa did a great job helping us out through the year. Here's a picture of me using a milling machine. Certain parts that we made in the machine shop were the spring plate, motor rollers, motor brackets, as well as many other components. And before machining, everything was pretty much 3D printed to prove the concept. So as Kevin said, we uh, 3D printed our fabric feed. Uh, we just didn't have time to machine it. But this is comprised of a spring plate that uh, would push the next fabric into position to be fed onto the conveyor using a piston. Um, this is the first iteration, again, it's 3D printed, so it lacks some stability and rigidity, but modifications uh, will be made uh, to produce a better, more consistent uh, product. Through testing our rolling chamber, we were able to uh, prove out this concept and add modifications that were needed. In the bottom left, you can see a picture of our 3D printed model, and Kyle there is actually pulling it by hand and bringing the fabric through, letting us know that this idea did work. And then over the right, you can see our final product. We decided to use a second motorized roller that helps to keep the substrate rolling once the fabric enters. And then conveyor testing as well, we were able to make a lot of modifications. Our original setup, the uh, conveyor skipped, so we ended up adding grooves onto the rollers that pushed the conveyor. We also learned that <coughs> angling the roller helped to align the conveyor while it was moving on its own. This uh, led to a very consistent product. Here's a video of our substrate feed testing. As you can see, the piston extends and moves the substrate from where it's loaded into the rolling chamber. And with that extended piston, it keeps the next substrate right in line so that when it retracts, it's right in line, ready to be loaded, making the process very repeatable. And our substrate loading tray is gravity fed and can be adjusted to X amount of pieces depending on what output they want. So here's a list of our electrical components. Some of the key components within the list would be the uh, 24 volt uh, AC DC converter, as well as our voltage regulators, as the two Arduino nanos that we utilize take 5 volt power, and with 24 volt they end up dry. And because of the fact we were using 5 volt power on our Arduinos, they gave a 5 volt source out of them. So we had to utilize 24 volt, 5 volt relays to actuate all of the machines that ended up requiring the 24 volt uh, power source. Uh, moving into our system components, uh, as you've heard, we have uh, multiple pistons as well as multiple motors that drive our machine. So, uh, some of the motors we use are stepper motors. We used a smaller one for the rolling chamber and a much more industrial one for the conveyor belt as it had to be under high tension to maintain uh, friction with the conveyor belt that we're utilizing. And the components for the pistons were all pneumatically actuated. So we also used uh, some air regulators to maintain pressures and not uh, exceed certain thresholds. And uh, here's just our uh, right there is system testing. So uh, to begin with our system testing, we started out with LED lights. That way we could uh, prove out the concepts. So you can see up in the top red video, the LED lights were flashing one by one. That's uh, essentially the order of the uh, pistons that would be going uh, with some different timings. And the reason we used LEDs versus our pneumatic solenoids uh, and Arduinos is because to prove out our concepts, we wanted to make sure that uh, we were not damaging any vital parts uh, in doing that. So we used the um, LEDs if they have a low point. So if there was a problem, they would have burned out, signaling that that's a part we need to uh, Moving forward, there are a good amount of improvements we'd like to make. 
One is we'd like to add an adhesive dispenser. The pumps we are currently using, uh, the lines clog because they're not meant to move something that's gonna dry and clog them. Uh, this was a little bit out of our current range, so we did not go ahead and buy it this year. Also, the conveyor belt is something that should be improved upon. The current belt we have now is stapled together, and we do have plastic rollers. For durability reasons, we'd like to have an actual conveyor and uh, metal rollers to help move it. Also, the fabric feed is currently all 3D printed. It did prove out the concept really well, but due to time restraints, we did not have time to actually manufacture it. We believe that manufacturing it will help become more consistent. So, so for the time management and project management part of it, I utilize a lot of hand charts um, to organize our long-term goals for the certain gates throughout the semester. Um, gates one through four were pretty much like figuring out the problem that we had, uh, decide on a concept, and just start designing certain components of it, such as the, the spring plate and uh, figuring out what we were going to do. Um, so this this semester five through eight uh, gates five through eight focus more on manufacturing these things, uh, tweaking them, making sure that it all worked correctly to together. Um, and of course, with all every design process, there are certain things that need to be tweaked and improved upon, uh, sort of, or upgraded on the fly. Um, so we did a de very good job on that, uh, handling all those hurdles. Uh, so here's our budget. Uh, our budget for this specific year uh, was three grand, three thousand um, dollars. But like it was mentioned beforehand, it was a this is a multi-year project, and for the past two years, it fifteen thousand six hundred and twenty-one dollars were invested into this project. Um, so. For a total investment into this project, it was just under $18,000 with $17,926. Um, and for this year, we have been under this $3,000 threshold by uh, just under $700. Um, so as you can see, um, I didn't put all our entire bill of materials here because we did buy a lot of components. Um, so I just broke it down into which uh, supplier we bought from. So those are the four major ones. So our challenges that we have encountered throughout this whole project are um, the first one being our budget because we, uh, due to the components that were necessary in order to make this, uh, this machine production ready and uh, to create the highest quality parts, we needed to uh, to get adhesive dispensers that were uh, on the price high price side, but um, due to their repeatability and their ability to effectively um, dispense the adhesive Loctite, which cures very fast, uh, it it will definitely have a high ROI in this case. Um, so another one is that we didn't have uh, an electrical engineer on this team, so we had to improvise ourselves. Nate, Nate did a great job on this. Uh, he, he did a lot of research. He uh, told me which stuff I'd buy, so then I bought it, and then um, he went away, plugging, plugging away. Um, next thing is uh, scheduling uh, team meetings and meetings with our uh, different faculty uh, to go over certain things um, because all of our schedules did mesh into each other so that was definitely a uh, hardship that we encountered um, and toward the, our group was a special case because we uh, sort of got a <laughs> little late start to the year because a lot of groups were forming at the time and ours was formed a little late um, so we definitely had to um, Catch up, play a game of catch up until we started running, uh, running with this project. So that was definitely a, um, we overcame a bunch of hurdles and definitely proud of this team for that. Um, so I used the MS Plan Microsoft Planner to assign tasks throughout the weeks uh, and ensured that 
uh, every person got strength, uh, tasks assigned to their strengths, so everything would get accomplished on time. So we utilized three main uh, communication methods, including email, uh, Teams meetings, and text messaging. Uh, text messaging was the most convenient as everyone has a cell phone, and we, uh, if anyone had a quick thought, we would definitely just sit, uh, ask the group, and we would get quick answers out of it. As a group, we'd like to thank uh, Paul Souza for his help in the machine shop. We'd also like to thank Dr. Kean Park for his uh, weekly meetings and guidance throughout the design process. We'd also like to thank Dr. Hamas Hamadari for his uh, guidance during the project, and also uh, Ray Soprano and the entire Davico team for sponsoring this project. Thank you very much. Is there any questions?